All right. Well, thanks for coming back to the Bigfoot Society podcast. I have the privilege of having Mr. Seth Breedlove with me on the podcast tonight. And uh, of course, if you don't know Seth, uh, he is an amazing filmmaker with the production company Small Town Monsters. I uh, have a lot of really cool films under their uh, belt and uh, just all around good guy. Uh, Seth, would you mind going ahead and introducing yourself? Yeah, I'm Seth. That's me. And I'm, I'm sitting here in my, my family room with my schnauzer. Every time <laughs> I, I talk to you, I have to, I feel like I have to mention the fact that you have contributed to, to an STM film. Um, That's true. It's, it's like, uh, um, Jeremiah is like, has skin in the game or like when you say that, Hey, I own stock in this company, which yeah. I don't, but it's true. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. You worked on, um, on, on the interviews in terror in the sky. Um, I did Chad, Chad and Kevin, Chad, Chad Lewis and Kevin Nelson, which the, the thing that still drives me crazy there's a lot of things that bug me about Terror in the Skies, but one of the things that bugs me about Terror in the Skies is that those two interviews look better than all of my interviews in the movie. And so, oh, really? so like Andrew just comes in and like, yeah, I remember he started sending me stills. I was at the Mothman Festival and you guys were at the Van Meter Festival, right? Am I wrong? I feel like we were at the Mothman. Festival. So here's the thing. And so I'm sorry, listeners, because I get feedback on this where I talk about the Van Meter Visitor Festival every episode, but you mm-hmm. just heard that Seth brought it up. So let's go for it. It's go time. So you are correct. Um, it was really cool day. Like Andrew, uh, so my buddy, Andrew Peterson, um, he's, uh, he's was doing the, you know, interviews for Terror in the Skies. And so we just happened to have some of the guys that were also at the Van Meter Visitor Festival that year. And it was really cool. Um, he, I thought I was just going to be there kind of like uh, watching the interviews. And at the last minute, he's like, Hey, uh, why don't you kind of, why don't you do this? And so a lot of that was like just me jumping into it. And I think in a way that kind of, uh, you know, kind of gave me the taste for, for going into this. So it's kind of cool. It was a great what experience. Did you, what, what did you do? You were like, um, <clears throat> you were, I have no idea what you did. Um, <laughs> so well, like, I was because <laughs> because it's indie film, so he, he gives, it's indie film. So like he gives me a, a a credit to give you, but I don't know. Oh my I, gosh. Aren't, you, aren't you credited as like first AC or first so like first? Yeah, something yes. like assistant director or just, no, like, no, no. Yeah, I'm the head of STM now, Seth. Yeah. So what I uh, what I was doing was. Um, I was asking them the questions and um, <clears throat> then they would answer, but then my part wouldn't be on video or audio okay. type deal. So I'm, I'm sorry. You're good. <laughs> that's, that's a shame. Um, so yeah. So, so Andrew, oh I just remember that when he started sending me stills, I yeah. was like, we had done interviews the same day he had done interviews. And I'm like, well, my interviews look like garbage. compared to <laughs> And um. And he just like, yeah, because he's got he's got a much better eye um, than I do. And also, like, I think he knowing Andrew, he probably went into it like grossly over prepared. And I go into everything like fantastically hor- horrifically so. un- under prepared for every single thing. So like we come in with like, oh, we got like one LED light. We can try to light this thing. We have no extension cord. So we're shooting everything with like a battery. I mean, it was just, I just remember that, that his interviews looked way better than mine. Dude, it was, le- it was a legit setup. Like my buddy, Andrew's a cool dude. He's, he's awesome, man. I, I, I used to work with him at Apple. He's, he's a good guy. So that's the connection there. But, oh, okay. um, hmm. so, uh, do you mind if we get into, uh, some questions? No, I'm, awesome. I, if occasionally I forget to mute my mic and you're hearing like ice in my plastic uh, Akron Zoo cup. I'm sorry. Oh, so. hey, that's just part of the ambiance. So yeah, I love it. Um, so of course, so let's see. Uh, Small Town Monsters has been around for a few years, correct? I want to say uh, 2013. Is that right? Uh, 2013 is actually like when I put the concept together for okay. the book. Um, 2015 marks the year that we put out Minerva, but we actually okay. started shooting in 2014. 
Gotcha. So it's it's um cool. this is our official like five year anniversary year right. for STM. Hence the uh, the amazing five year book that's coming out, which is now one of my life's ultra regrets that I wasn't a Kickstarter backer um, for the last one. Man, because, I'm so st- I'm so stoked oh, to get these out because like I th- we're shipping we should be shipping. Uh, I th- I'm gonna say like tentatively next week sometime stuff's oh, gonna wow. start shipping. That's um, amazing. And I guess that's even possible this week. But we're just waiting. The uh, Mothman Legacy DVDs and Blu-rays are, are coming any day. It should be like today or tomorrow. Wow. It should be here. So once that stuff hits, um, we're shipping all that stuff out. But the book, yeah, the book's in- insane. Like I guess I'm not in the book hardly at all. Like mm-hmm. I, I contributed the intro. Um, my wife designed it uh, mm-hmm. with, no pr- with no prior like book design experience and um it's a coffee table sized book so it's like 11 by i'm looking at it now i don't know it's it's probably like it's i know it's 11 inches long and then maybe like nine inches tall it's pretty big um i it's like next to all it sits on the bookshelf with all my making of books and it's like comparable in size to those so it's a big book so she had to put all that together and that includes like a ton of bts um photos and then sketches and stuff like that but then the whole thing was written by mark Matsky, and mm. then uh, as far as the his, historical uh context goes and then um there's three interviews that are very lengthy one with adrian one with brandon and one with jason okay um and that's kind of like the, the book's comprised of that but it's 200 pages i mean it's a good size freaking book like and it's um it's really cool. I'm super stoked. I'm stoked now to figure out what we're going to do going forward. Cause now we know how to make a book. Mm. Um, and I feel like we need to make more books. So I was actually just like contemplating what, what the next book should be. I'm still trying to figure that out. So, uh, and so people listening, if you really are digging this part, then you should listen to the latest episode of Monsteropolis because uh, Seth and Mark just talked for quite a while about uh, the book itself, which is amazing. But you guys uh, also said a thing where it's like, you know, we're kind of a book production company. We should go into this. And the ideas you had about like releasing the scripts with the script in the, the notes was actually yeah. like, that was a fantastic idea. Like, I think that is really cool. You know what I'm thinking? I was i'm just spitballing here but like i was thinking i was just thinking at the end of each year we should do making ofs for the two films that came out the previous year Mm. so this kickstarter coming up would be a making of book that's split into two parts the making of the mothman legacy and the making of the mark of the Mm -hmm. bell witch and and each part would include the scripts the only thing about that for like bell witch is as of right now Bell Witch doesn't have a script. It might be the first STM movie oh. since Minerva that doesn't have straight straight narration. I'm using Lauren Ashley Carter signed on to be our narrator, but if I don't, I've always wanted to go back to that Minerva storytelling trope of like not using, uh, I, I think trope's the wrong word, but that's the, that Minerva storytelling device of not using a narrator. Sure. And this kind of offers us the the perfect opportunity the only thing i'm including a lot of the mv ingram book like she would actually be just reading lines from the actual original uh bell witch mv ingram book um so that might be what we end up doing or i mean that that's subject to change i'm very early in the edit on that so but anyway the point is like if we did if we did that i'm not sure how that would work as far as like including the scripts but i think the scripts are I think if people could see the scripts in writing, you would get an idea of how much I lack as a writer. Like it would really help people to, to fully understand that like most of the time the writing is like laughably terrible. And Mark, Mark has to go, Mark's usually the one that like edits my writing at the end of the day. Like he has to come in and oh, okay. fix it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So he, he has to kind of like salvage uh, the, uh, the, the, the garbage that I've like vomited onto the page. Um, because, because the way this works, like the way that the storytelling works with SDM movies is I sit and put together like a really rough cut of the movie okay. and I, I write the narration as I'm editing. So I'll be editing and I hit a 
point where like it's a it you know we need to transition between w between scenes or whatever and this is like a good point for narration and then i will sit there and i'll scribble down the narration really quickly and then i narrate it into my phone i airdrop it to myself so i get it on my mac and then i immediately put it in the timeline nice. so there's usually a turnaround time of like maybe five minutes where <laughs> where a chunk of narration is written so like the very wow. early rough cut rough cuts of our movies are really bizarre because it's like all of a sudden there's like you know beautiful imagery or whatever and then you cut into like a black screen and then my voice comes in on my iphone and there's like clocks <laughs> chiming or like tommy screaming in the background or something and it's like that's great yeah it's wild i, I love that i love that stuff um so remind me before you went uh full time into small town monsters uh you were in um like a, a newspaper journalist uh type role or or what role uh, was that again no i mean that was that was really like i did i did so i did uh freelance reporting okay i was a freelance reporter and columnist for maybe like eight years i don't even know if it was that long it's probably like six seven years um for maybe three or four local papers and i also did some some movie reviews on the okay. side whenever whenever my buddy um who was the editor there would let me write so i got to review like the highlight of that was like i reviewed um scott pilgrim which is still like one of my favorite movies um really yeah so so i got to <laughs> review scott pilgrim so that was like that was a highlight, but yeah, I, I did. And then I used to do a front page column for the Mass Lane Independent that was called Slice of Life, which was, um, dude, I would go and I would re interview um, small business owners around um, Stark County in Ohio and uh, turn it into like a story about their business. Um, mm -hmm. And you can still find a lot of those columns actually on their website. And you can find like, you can find the um the stories i wrote for them as well and then i went to israel back in like 2008 or 2009 and they really? let me write about write about that as well for the paper so oh, so cool. yeah i did i did i did um that's kind of like that informed that definitely informed the direction we've gone with stm because i think that was like how i learned to be objective and not mm -hmm. and, and then like that's why uh, so many of the early stm projects and like the films don't involve us in any way, like myself in any way. On the trail, it's different, but as far as the movies are concerned, I, I try to keep myself completely absent from those. Interesting. Uh, what was it that pushed you? Um, was there a, a point in life or something that, that pushed you that said, okay, I'm going to go, I, I want to do this STM thing. This, now I'm going for it. Like, there's no going back now. Um, you know, it's weird because, um, yeah, there is, um, we were, well, there's two, there's two points like that. So the first is, um, I was working a medical billing job when we started making Minerva. Okay. So, so we were making Minerva and it was a, a really, um, I try to be nice cause they were super supportive of the movie, but it was like, so, so boring, like just yeah mind numbing like I, I would sit and cry mm. there, there were days where i would literally cry the job was so terrible um and so like i remember uh we were making minerva we were getting ready to release minerva and we had had it's so, like the back the secret the secret of stm we get we get referred to uh very often as being like um uh million people say we're like millionaires or like i'm a millionaire or <laughs> like <laughs> yeah or like uh or like we're we're uh we're rich from making these little like independent movies um but like the secret is we've been getting contacted by major tv networks since before yeah. since before minerva was released are you serious so, so like um Wow. Yeah, and the first one, and I've talked about this, like the first one is the infamous um, Megan Fox show that we were pitched before um, before Minerva had even come out. They wanted to make a movie with like me and the guys that were involved in STM at the time riding nice. around in a, in a van with Megan Fox um, oh. hunting small town monsters. 
And so that was like very early on in the game, we, we could tell that this was going to be something. Mm-hmm. We, we, I think early on, we also thought like many people that once you start getting contacted by TV production companies and stuff, man, you you are going to be rich. Like there's no way you're not going to be rich because you, you're talking to TV companies and all that. We had no idea what we were doing. Right. So like, so um, right before, li- literally my last day as a full-time employee at the medical billing company was the day um, we premiered, the day before we premiered Minerva at the Ohio Bigfoot conference. Oh, wow. So I, I went down to part time um, because I just wanted to focus on the filmmaking, yep. and um, and I and I was putting so much time into filmmaking at that point that I was essentially working like two full time jobs at once. So like I just didn't. Oh, wow. I, I would work at at work. I would be working somehow on small town monsters still, <laughs> even at my medical billing job. I'd be contacting media or whatever, and um, so. So the first time, I mean, I just remember the impetus for all of that was like, we could tell that there was a a big interest in Minerva Monster and that it was, it was probably going to, you know, be, be something special. And it was, um, it didn't make any money. (laughs) Like Minerva never made, (laughs) Minerva never made any money, but it did have a lot of like local interest and it definitely like opened the door for us to do more. Um, movies yep. so so it was just that day um you know going down to part-time at the job and then the next step would be in 2017 uh when uh, the mothman of point pleasant came out mm. um when mothman hit uh we were making invasion on chestnut ridge in pennsylvania and okay. it, it came out our first day of filming so we were filming invasion on chestnut ridge and we're, we're all staying together in this haunted farmhouse in the middle of nowhere in, in in Pennsylvania and Mothman came out and we we started tracking it early in the day which we do when a movie comes out or we put something out you can kind of track the success of it you know like watch right the best yeah, yeah exactly exactly the movie came out and by like um 6 p.m that night it was like the number one best-selling horror movie oh, and we wow. were we were like well that's crazy so then then and then we just watched it rise mm-hmm. um on on the other list we started watching like the reg just the straight up like new release list and it was like climbing and and by the time we went to bed it was at like number 50 wow. and i was like well that's pretty crazy and then the next morning it was at like number six so it was the number six best-selling movie on amazon the next morning the new that's release crazy movie. and and then later that day, it passed like Rogue One on the overall list. What? It was like, yeah, it was outselling <laughs> Rogue One. So like we, oh man, when we got back from when we got back from that trip, you know, we had just had Tommy. Um, okay. He he was tiny at that point, and we were, I mean, literally, he was like a few weeks old. Oh wow. Um, the first the first like month of Tommy's life was so weird because. Um, he was born on April 25th and, and on like, on like May, the second week in May, we were in Point Pleasant for five days filming a Japanese TV show and him and his mom were in a hotel together <laughs> for the entire time I was filming the show in Point Pleasant. So that was like within the first month of his life. And then I went and filmed wow. Invasion. And then I came back and I was just like, I'm going to focus on this um, because this movie is going to do well enough to to mm-hmm. take care of us for a little while yeah, it was it was a, it's still a huge risk because you don't know what's going to happen but the sure. thing about that wasn't necessarily that i quit my job it was that adrian quit hers uh, so then it became then it became okay now i i have to make sure this succeeds because we're both mm, yeah our entire livelihood is hinging on this so on, um yeah 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 and then things just kind of like over the course of that year we just um, kept coming up with like more and more ideas. Like that's what the year we kind of came up, dreamed up on the trail of, and that's mm-hmm. the year we oh, yeah. s- sort of set the tr- the path for STM for the next few years because we started doing, you know, we we had been doing two movies a year, but we added in on the trail of, and then it was three mm-hmm. productions a year. And now, you know, this year was also three productions, but next year is going to be f- at least four, if not five. We've got two on the trail of productions coming out um, on the trail of Bigfoot. Um, there's two on the trail Jeez. of Bigfoot's coming out next year. Um, we have uh, 
this Rue Guru thing we haven't even announced yet as like our movie for next year. Um, well, I mean, we've got to do. Just, we just announced we, it here. We get, we're working <laughs> on getting the financing together to do on the Trail of UFO season two. Oh, um, cool. San, Santino really wants to do on the Trail of Haunting. So like, there's a there's mm. next year's going to be anywhere from four to six productions. Next Dude. Year. So that's intense. Like that's 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 intensity going from up to that amount i can't even imagine that like i mean but if you love what you're doing like that's your that's the dream right just like yeah, going no, for I, it. Mean, I love it yeah where, where you where you yeah you reach um so i spent 30 i was 33 when we started on minerva okay so i i always say i spent 33 years trying to find something i liked working at doing mm, and i, and I yep. think that's like um I th i've i've always been a very lazy person so so <laughs> if for for me to find something that would kind of get me out of that that headspace and like where, where i want to where i want to work at being better at it and i want to put yep. the time in that was like the most important thing for me because i don't come from a family of lazy people my grandpa was my grandpa was like friggin amish like he, he's oh, he wow. grew up he grew up amish so he was like oh, wow. the the hardest working person i ever known totally. he worked until he was 93 years old and he oh. retired and then he died like that's my my family that's how they function so i was like i was like the weird one because i didn't have that uh, but now that i'm doing movies like this is all i do so this is what I like to do. Like you were caught, like as we were getting ready to have this meeting, I was watching videos on, on different lenses and cameras and stuff. Of course. So like that's, is, that's what you would do. Yeah. Like yeah. I watch YouTubes on uh, yeah. how to interview people or yeah. like study uh, certain famous podcasters and try to get their, you know, how they come up with questions and stuff. Um, what would you say, what's your uh, main motivation right now as a filmmaker? uh just feeding my family <laughs> uh you know like no i mean it's feeding my family and then artistically it's making sure we're we're not just stagnant mm. um okay that 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 really is like the biggest uh challenge for us is we're doing so many productions mm -hmm. that i i feel like sometimes you we almost have to force ourselves to to create obstacles that we have to figure out a way around mm. because um, otherwise we'll just keep doing the same thing over and over. And so like the mark of the bell, which is interesting because we have to, you know, I mean, we've, we've made, we made a quote unquote name for ourselves by doing movies where we interview witnesses. Well, like, what does that, what does that look like when we don't have any witnesses when there's literally like oh, yeah. not a single witness in the entire movie? Yeah. And so, um, you know, like, how do we, how do we do that and do it in a different way from Momo? I think there was like a weird misconception last year that when Momo came out, that was like the way we were going to do things going forward. I don't, really? I, I'm still <laughs> confused by that. Yeah. People were like, people were either like, oh man, I can't wait to see you do a movie like this, but about Bigfoot or, oh, or, no. or like Mothman or no. And I'm like, no, I mean, it's like a one-off. We don't, yeah, exactly. We, we, try, we really yeah. don't try it. Even, you know, the Mothman legacy um, is a sequel and it, and it, and I think it feels like a sequel. And at the same time, we did something completely different from what we did with the Mothman of Point Pleasant because the Mothman of Point Pleasant spends, you know, probably like eight, nine minutes of screen time on animated sequences. And there's like, mm -hmm. it's helping tell the story. And in this, there's yeah. nothing, there's no hand-drawn animation. We, have, we avoid that. We kind of like, yeah, it's just the biggest thing for us right now is just constantly challenging ourselves. On the Trail of is great because it offers us, it's like an avenue to go back to the way we did movies when we first started. Okay. Um, and that's why I love On the Trail of because it's just us and a, uh, me and a camera or us and a camera. And it's a return to making movies the way we did with like Whitehall. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, that's the motivation is trying to find new ways to tell a story. Um, I think I think Bell Witch is going to be interesting because 
we we've never approached the level of or the the sheer like volume of recreations that that mm, we've just okay. we've just finished with uh bell witch like we just rented a farmhouse for five days and shot wow. um you know numerous we shot 12 uh two 12 hour days um yeah. there was the first day was eight hours and then we did two back-to-back 12 hour days and then there was a uh like a four hour day on sunday um you know and there's and, and it, the the wild thing is it's like mostly practical effects so far um we did a lot oh, okay. of like old school old school like fishing line and you know oh, really? doors doors closing oh, yeah, the fishing dude. line and yeah and, <clears throat> we bought a, a Fresnel light, which I've always wanted to buy, but it never okay. actually gotten. So we, we went and bought a Fresnel light so we could mimic lightning. And that's actually, oh. we just put out a production still t- tonight, like the first I saw production that. still. And yep. that's during, that's like during the sequence that I dreamed up um, called the lightning storm sequence. Um, and that was, that's been interesting too, because Mark of the Bell, which the, the, the recreations, some of the recreations are things I just dreamed up to illustrate, mm. um, uh, to, to sort of condense a number of events that actually did occur. Okay. Um, so, so you'll see what I mean when you see the movie. It's I can't not, wait to see it's, it. It's, yeah. it's not fictional, but it's like, it's a, it's the first, we were talking about it. Um, Richard Haddam sent me this amazing review of Mothman Legacy where he claimed we were like inventing a new genre with what we're doing. Wow. And and I don't see that with Legacy, but I could see that with Mark of the Bell Witch. Like Mark mm. of the Bell Witch is, is a really, uh, I think it's going to be a really, it's going to feel like the first genuine horror movie slash documentary, Ooh. like where you're seeing. Um, yeah, yeah. There's going to be numerous jump scares too, so I'm pumped. Oh, that. jump scares! Oh, I can't handle those. Those I can't even handle signs, man. <laughs> I'm I'm yeah. pumped for your movie. Like that's going to be great. Um. So, another question. Um, let's say you're you do the edit. You do a lot of like the editing yourself. Um, is there uh, do you have like a uh, music you listen to to get pumped to to edit or like uh what's your go-to get pumped to, to film music? Do you have anything or you just, it's in, or is it all in your well, mind? When I, and you're just like, bam, go. When I edit, it depends on the project. Sometimes I don't edit to any music. Um, oh, wow. Okay. The Mothman Legacy, I didn't have any music in the edit. Um, but I am editing sequences from Mark of the Bell, which starting today, I was editing the two sequences I worked on today. I had music I downloaded from Artlist. Um, okay. I know when we made Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, I used uh, a lot of like John Carpenter uh, Halloween. In fact, mm-hmm. I think that was like mostly Invasion on Chestnut Ridge was mostly edited to Halloween. That makes um, sense. Or, or like Neon Demon uh, was another. Um, the Goblin score for, for Dawn of the Dead. Oh, um, wow. Things like that. Uh, but it, yeah, it kind of depends on the project. When it comes to like music to film, I don't, I don't. Oh yeah, that. Sorry, that's a weird question. That wouldn't well, no, make sense. It's, uh, it's, it is kind of cool though, because um, because I do watch. So I've I do pump myself up to film. <laughs> okay. As goofy okay. as that sounds, like um, before we did the Mark of the Bullet shoot, I I had bought a. Last week I went and bought uh, this huge like coffee table book um, about Wes Anderson. Um, oh nice yeah like Wes Anderson movies and it, it's just like these massive interviews with him and as stupid or goofy as that might sound like that kind of thing really does pump me up like reading other filmmakers talking about cool making movies um so I don't there there isn't really music that I listen to to pump up get pumped up to make movies but I will I will spend hours watching um making ofs and things like that that are kind of like relevant to what we're working on obviously Wes Anderson doesn't really it's not really relevant to the Mark of the Bell Witch but that was like the thing that I latched on to I did watch like the morning I was getting ready to leave to go do our first day of filming on the recreations for Bell Witch I watched a bunch of uh, a bunch of YouTube um, analysis videos about Psycho um, ah. just because I well I'm a huge Hitchcock fan but just okay 
that just popped up. There was something on this on my YouTube main page about Psycho, and I just put it on, and then I just started watching video after video about Psycho. Yeah. So I don't know nice, if that'll nice. be if that'll sneak its way into Mark of the Bell Witch or not. But that, I know Mark cool. of the Bell Witch visually is drenched in Robert Weiss's The Haunting, which I've okay. just recently discovered and have been watching nonstop. And uh, Terry Gilliam, like Terry Gilliam really shoots with that insanely wide close up. Mm -hmm. When he shoots his close ups, he shoots like crazy wide and it like almost warps people's faces. Um, and this movie has that look. And you're going to see it when I start posting stills of like Mark Matsky and some of the people that are in the movie. Like it's, it's really obvious. Where, I'm excited. Where we're going yeah. for. That's awesome. Um, I have a few questions for you about uh, folklore. Um, um, is that cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Um, I was going to say I'm terrible about about defining folklore, which if no. you listen to the episode where I interviewed or Ellie interviewed me um, um, of Monsteropolis, so that should be obvious that I'm still kind of like not quite clear on the difference between like folklore and legend. Okay, but, well, yes. we, we won't get too crazy, but I do have a definition here, so don't worry. Okay, cool. Um, okay. So folklore definition. The traditional beliefs, customs, and stories of a community pass through the generations by word of mouth. Uh -huh. Cool. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. what is it that draws you? Um, uh, why are you so focused on uh, smaller communities? I see that as a common thread through uh, a lot of your movies or, you know, documentaries, things like that. Yeah, I don't relate to to big cities and big city mm -hmm. people so like I, but it, not not because of anything against them i just didn't grow i grew up in a small town uh, okay um i spent the first 25 years of my life not leaving that small town and so and i've only ever lived other than when i lived in canton for a few years and i don't really think that's a big city but it's it's a city um yeah it's more um I, I've always been fascinated by small town life too. Um, mm -hmm. yep. And and I don't think I have like rose colored glasses about it. Like I, I, I see, I see, so, I see the negativity in some small towns as well. Um, you know, like we got run out, we get run out of places all the time. Making these Do movies. you really? We just no had way. Happen, yeah. We just had, Oh happen, man. man uh, Mark of the oh, Bell Witch, we had a guy run us out of the of the uh, a cemetery. We had permission to film him, like showed up oh, and just cussed, cussed me out. Um, really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, so I don't have rose colored glasses on about it, but <laughs> I do. I love small towns, and there was my brother and I when we were kids. I mean, I watched, I I devoured film. That was like mm -hmm. all I did. Okay. So I had I had film theories and things like that as a kid. That you know, like I we started noticing common threads in movies and one of them was like the small town movie genre um you know there's like doc hollywood and mumford and like all these oh, yeah, all sure. these like different little like movies um you know that that kind of like dwell on small town life and that goes but all the way back to like frank capra and mm. it's a it's a wonderful life and all that kind of stuff as well but like exactly yeah yeah um but i've i always loved those movies um, David Mamet made a movie. Of, that might be Mumford. I can't remember. David Mamet made made a comedy about like small town, a small town, and and I I found that when I was like, those were the pick the pick me up movies were like mm. small comedies about life in small towns, and then when I got into um, newspaper writing, that was like, that was my job was my my <clears throat> my beat quote unquote beat was this tiny village called Navarre. Uh, which is a Navarre, uh, a town, uh, I don't even know, it's a village, but I mean, it's, it's tiny. It's right outside of Maslin, Ohio, okay. um, right down the road from Canton. And um, so like, uh, you know, I, I interviewed small business owners in small towns too. So yeah, I mean, small towns is just where I, and, and so when it comes to cryptids and the paranormal, the reason I started doing this isn't that I love bigfoot or the mothman it's that i'm interested in how bigfoot or the mothman might impact or change the culture of a community 
okay. you're not going to have that in a big city. It's too big, you know, it's too, it's too massive to have any impact at all. But a, a small town like Minerva can completely, it can alter the way they make money. Mm, you know, it can yep. alter the, the financial state of a small town. Minerva is a bad example because they haven't embraced it the way some someplace like Point Pleasant has, or even Falk, where yeah. the biggest breadwinner in Falk, Arkansas, which is a town of like six hundred and some people, the biggest breadwinner there is the Monster Mart, the Monster you know, Mart. with their yep, giant exactly. giant Bigfoot on the roof. So yeah, <laughs> that's that's the thing that I'm interested in even more so than the monsters. That's awesome. That is a super way uh, to encapsulate everything right there. What you just yeah. said, I love that. Um, how do you decide which folklore or legend or cryptid to pursue next? Is there kind of like a formula you follow or is it you just, you, you got a feeling? Well, go for yeah, I mean, it's the feeling, but it's also like, what can we do visually with that story? Mm, okay. So like the Mark of the Bell Witch was like a no brainer just because we hadn't done a ghost, sto a ghost story. Right. Um, so we wanted to do something that was a little more out there. It is funny though, until recently, until maybe two weeks before or even the week before we went to shoot Bellwitch, I didn't have a really clear idea of visually what it was going to be. And then wow. for some reason I was watching, um, you know, I was watching a lot of haunted house movies, just trying to get wrap my brain around what it was we were telling the story about because the movies are, yeah. Okay. It's a movie about the Bellwitch, but like, what is it about? every movie we've made is about something beyond the monster. Um, mm -hmm. yep. yep. So most of, most of them are about story, um, but, but the story and storytelling, but yeah, with, with, with bell, I, I was watching all these haunted house movies and I realized like, it's definitely a haunted house movie. Um, you know, it's, it's about this quote unquote spirit, but it's, it, it is about this, the house that we're living in being, you know, inundated with this malevolent force um that attacked them for four years or five years um but beyond that like what it what is it and then i i started thinking about we we had these three historians that we were going to interview and i was trying to figure out how that was going to work um and i really started to like the idea of interviewing those dudes together um because i knew one of them mm. was a young uh, this young guy named Brandon and then the other guy is this older historian who's kind of like you know he's 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 getting ready to pass the baton on to Brandon exactly. essentially as, yep. as like Adam's uh historian and I realized it was kind of like the old cop young cop like yep. kind of deal and I told Zach <laughs> uh visually I was like man this is like you know what it is it's a it's a haunted house movie it means a police procedural it's and so crazy we say things like that and then it doesn't happen. But like Zach and I actually just had this conversation after we finished shooting everything on Sunday, after we finished shooting everything yesterday, everyone left except Zach and I, we, sh we sat on the porch of the house and talked for a while, the house we had rented, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, this is the first movie where we had a conversation early on about what it was going to be. And it actually is what we talked about. Because nice. normally it just changes, just circumstantial or whatever it changes, and this one, this one, pretty much stuck to what we were, you know, talking about going into it. What was the question? How did I start talking about this? Uh, well, we were just kind of discussing some uh, Bell Witch stuff, which actually leads me into some Bell Witch questions, if that's cool. Yeah, but I feel like I yeah. didn't hit my the point of that question. Uh, well, the... you know, we were. Let's see here. It was. I have so many notes and questions I'm sorry, right now. Man. No, you're good. Oh, uh, how do you decide which folklore legend to pursue? And yeah, oh, yeah. we covered yeah, it. Yeah, yep. yeah. You're good. I mean, it comes it comes down to the people too, though. Like, yeah. if I'm if I'm not interested in the people, and I can't f find a way uh, to tell a story that will be different visually from our other stories, I, mm. you know, like we 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 won't tell that story, even That's if it's huge. like a really cool cryptid. The other thing is like. The, the unfortunate reality of doing what we do is we have to be aware that like some of this stuff is not going to be commercially viable. 
So like, heck mm. yeah, I would make a Fresno Nightcrawlers movie. Oh my But goodness. it's it's imagine? not gonna it's not gonna friggin' make a dime. <laughs> so like, well, no, I it'll make it. a dime. I'll give you a dime. Like, I can't, can't oh do it. Oh my gosh, dude, do it. I I killed it. My <laughs> wife wants me to make a, a sky a movie about sky squids, which I'm pretty sure is something she sky like squids. invented. It's yeah, she claims they're I'm sky squids. Okay. I'm loving it. I'll tell her. So questions about, about the Mothman. Um, no, sorry. My bad. Oh, my goodness. It's a long work day. Uh, Bell Witch. I've got different sections here. So, Bell Witch, why do you think the Bell Witch is such an uh, integrated part of Adams, Tennessee? This may seem really like an obvious question, but I'm just curious to get your thoughts on it. My wife is standing in the doorway glaring at me. Right? I wish I could turn my screen toward her. She heard Sky Squids and her name, so she's oh no, you're done down dude. here double checking. Yeah, why? Why is it such a big part of it? Um, yeah, why do you think? You know what? Honestly, dude, it's one of the more confusing. There's two parts to that question. One is like, why are the bells mm. such an important part yes. of Adams, Tennessee? We yes. can't quite figure this out. That's weird, right? Um. Yeah. It's really bizarre because there's there's a big Mason connection in this town. Oh, I'm glad you're bringing this up. Yeah. And <clears throat> and it's like, we were actually just looking at footage yesterday. And on the side of the Bell Graves, there, there's this cemetery. There's, there's this massive cemetery mm -hmm. with an obelisk in the middle of it oh my. called Bellwood. And all Bellwood. the generations, yeah, all the generations of the bells are buried there. And if you look oh, no. at the, the headstones, they all have either a mason symbol or that whatever the, the female, the lady masons are called. It's like daughters sure. of the star or something like that. Okay. So, so there's this weird Masonic connection there. Um, wow. And I, I'm not, I am not down, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily conspiracy minded when it comes to the masons right i do i do think there's some strange things happening there and we got you know like we got taken into the the uh the mason lodge in in um adams while we were there which is kind of a weird story in itself that story um, on monsteropolis is the best one of the best stories you've ever told it, it is so, so good it's so good <laughs> so weird um oh my gosh so, so so there's the weird mason thing but um the bells were a poor family like this would be you know it's a town that where there's probably generation upon generation of poor people there who've been forgotten mm. so what is it about the bells that we're still like obsessing over, over yeah. or not not obsessing but like that they're celebrated there to the degree mm. that they are Okay. So that, that part of it's strange. And then, you know, and, and the two were probably intertwined. The fact that the Bell Witch is such a popular story. It's called the most famous haunting in American history. So okay, even though we in the, the present generation might kind of, I don't think it's forgotten, but I think it might be overlooked a little bit now in favor of things like Amityville. The, the Bell Witch is the, the the grand the granddaddy of them all like hmm. it's it's the it's the ultimate american haunting um and once you get into investigating the story it becomes pretty apparent why i mean there's so much to it um so i think they they just celebrate it in adams because it's a key piece of their history and it's the most well known part of their yep. history it's i Makes mean sense. you could say that about most of these small you could say sure. that about yeah Point exactly Plus. yeah um so so it's just it's there it's celebrated but i will say it's celebrated there in a way i don't see other places even point pleasant mm, celebrate their history because adams has a plaque a government plaque right outside the city hall Whoa. that is that says the bell witch and it's like an official state plaque and it oh gives the history of the bell witch and um they put on a play called spirit that's all about the bell witch really and, i love it yeah. yeah and and it's like their town play and and so oh, man so those little things you don't see point pleasant as a town doing no. that 
you know, they, they even the Mothman Festival that's put on by Jeff Wamsley. It's not put exactly. on by the town of Point Pleasant. They have some involvement, but it's not their event. So it is strange. Like they have really, um, they've embraced it. At the same time, they kind of scoff at it, but it's a scoff. It's a scoffing that comes with a certain level of respect for the the story, which is is difficult for me to explain. Except that I actually feel the same way because I don't know that mm. the Bell Witch. I don't know that I believe in the reality of the Bell Witch, but I am very cognizant of of being respectful of her and. Uh, and the story itself because i can tell you we've all been having nightmares on the crew every no single one of, every single are one you of kidding since, me no i mean there's some oh, creepy no. things there's a visually we are displaying uh kate in the movie in three different ways even though she wasn't really seen okay. um the bell witch uh we are like we're going to sh visually show her a few times in the movie oh, not much really? but like we're going to visually show her and the three different ways we're showing her are all are all sort of like callbacks to either pieces of her legend or pieces of something that there the picture i posted today you're seeing an outline yeah. of like a there's like antlers um that's based on a nightmare that that oh, Heather, geez. uh Heather Mosier had, um, where the bow witch was showing up to her in this cloak with a with a deer skull, basically. Are you head. kidding me? So, um, yeah, wow. and and that started. Um, so, bow witch has actually been on the table for us since at least 2018, and Heather, um, who's our research girl, um, she went to she she actually went to Adams back. I think it was 2018 when she went. And she did research for us for the for the story all the way back in 2018. Okay. Um, and she had nightmares leading up to that 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 trip that included the Bell Witch telling her she couldn't the Bell Witch herself could not wait to meet us. Um, and that we Shut were gonna the have, heck up. Yeah, that we were gonna have a lot of Dude. fun together and stuff like that. So yeah. and, and I've no, had no. I've been having nightmares uh, periodically, and so is Aaron, so is now Zach Zach had a nightmare too, but it involved him being on The Bachelor, and it's a little different from understandable, understandable, from, yeah, understandable. Yeah. Um, what's the point where you say this is like? So I'm I'm gonna go off script for a minute. There are certain things that I'm very um, aware of. I should probably like. It's, it's hard, Seth, because on the one hand, you're like, okay, there's like folklore I want to capture. But then if your crew is having dreams, like nightmares about this like entity, like where's the line, right? Like that can, that's, that's scary stuff, dude. Like, I well, don't know how yeah, I would feel about that, you know, like. My, my thing is we've all been very aware of this. Okay. So I think it, it's going to seep into your thoughts anyway. Sure, sure. For, for me, I haven't taken it. I haven't taken it with like the certain, a certain level of gravity because for me, um, I've been sort of inundating myself with horror for mm. the last month or so okay. trying to, to get my head in, sure. in the space of like needing to make sure. a horror movie. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely like it's Brandon told us that you know, Brandon's um, so Brandon Barker, he's he's actually a professor of folklore at Indiana University. He's also like, cool. the official Tennessee um, state folklorist. Oh, wow. So um, he told me like he doesn't believe in the Bell Witch, hmm. but he tr he treats it with respect. And he said people in that town, most of the people don't believe in the Bell Witch. But they, mm. they're not going to make fun of that story and they're not going to make fun of the Bell Witch and they're not going to tell you she doesn't exist to your face. So like that you treat that's it with a certain level of respect. And that's like, that's how I feel about it, weirdly enough. Like, mm. I don't know. I don't know what happened. You'll, you'll find out why I don't know what happened. There's so many variations of the story and there's okay. so much we can't corroborate. But there are weird things happening there even to this day. Wow. I might have to shift my spooky story around. Actually, now that I'm saying this, when we, yeah, yeah, mull it, mull it over as we go along. But that sounds like it could be, it could be good. Um, That's for so, your Patreon show, right? It is, yeah. 
I just wanted to make sure we plugged your Patreon show. Dude, the the Patreon uh, guys and and girl now because mm-hmm. Coco's in it from Strange Little Lands, which okay. Coco's bomb. Like she's great. She was a fun interview yesterday. Did she did she give you her email address? Uh I'm not asking you to give it out on the show. It's just uh <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I I mean I can't remember it, but yeah, I would have it because it's part of the like she usually she, sign up. She she gave me her email address and I yeah. died because it was it was hilarious when you know her. Okay. I hope she's listening to this because no, she's she's super oh, I cool. guarantee um, she is. Uh she made me the uh a headless horseman yep. sleepy hollow diorama a few months ago it's awesome so the uh the episode that uh we actually spend quite a bit of time where she goes into like the background and like like how the process and uh we used your piece as an example of the oh, process cool. it's pretty cool so it's a it's a fun interview um yeah. just check it out but uh so mothman want definitely want to talk about uh mothman legacy mm-hmm. uh, a few questions and um first one is uh so not like not trying to be like so I'll just ask it. Um, why make another Mothman film if you've made a few before already? Yeah, I mean, we've only made one Mothman movie. Okay. And that's the Mothman of Point Pleasant. However, I do consider Mothman of Point Pleasant, Terror in the Skies of the Mothman Legacy, our Mothman mm-hmm. trilogy. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and that's just because Terror in the Skies t- tonally feels very similar mm-hmm. to... Um, the Mothman of Point Pleasant, and you know, it really like picks up the melancholy of the terror. Terror really picks up like the melancholy of the third act of Mothman of Point Pleasant, and then just pushes it throughout the entire movie. Um, okay. And and so yeah, what I guess what drew me back to that is the fact that we just kept having Mothman witnesses contact us. Mm, so yep. we, i mean like i don't yep. at, at a certain point you realize okay there's more than enough witnesses to tell a movie or to tell a story here and the interesting the mothman yep. uh, mothman legacy has more on-screen witness interviews than anything we've done outside of on the trail of so it even outdoes boggy creek monster mm. um because we have what seven seven or eight witness interviews it's in, a lot yeah in the mothman legacy um and it's it and we had more um there's a story that's briefly touched on in one of the narrated sections where lyle talks about a uh, building engineer or an architect or something mm-hmm. seeing yep. a, a mothman outside a tunnel that guy was up for an interview i could have gotten that interview but oh, we really? were like we were dealing with covid and we were also dealing with yep. the fact that we were running out of time and money so yep. like a, exactly. certain stories got axed um yeah, we could have had, we probably could have had 12 eyewitness interviews in that movie easily. Um, but yeah, it was just the fact that there was more to tell. And then there was also the idea that we could finally do a movie that was as much about the phenomenon as it was about like a single event. Mm. So The Mothman and Point Pleasant is about the Mothman in Point Pleasant between 66 and 67. Um, just like Boggy Creek Monster is all about the Boggy Creek Monster, you know, being seen around Boggy Creek. Um, right. This was a movie that was as much about the folklore as it was the, the sightings mm-hmm. that were taking place. So it was yeah. like, you know, like it's, it's funny because the f- the only negative feedback I have received thus far regarding the Mothman legacy is that it doesn't get to the Mothman quick enough. Um, what? Come on. And and I'm like, if that's the case, you're <laughs> you're kind of like missing the whole point you're, of you're the missing movie. The point. Yeah, yeah. If like because we're we have to set up that Appalachian history. Like this this mm-hmm. is the one STM movie where to cut any piece of the the geographical history would sort of. De- ruin the point of the whole exactly um we we have to set up who lives there who settled it what their way of life was and i mean we managed to do that in a pretty quick period of time you're talking like five six minutes it's not terribly long yeah yeah but it's very important because there's there's a lot of elements of you know like um 
Irish Scottish legend that comes into play later in the movie. It does. Yeah, it really does. And it Um, also asks, it also asks viewers to like draw those lines themselves. Like we don't necessarily connect all the dots for people. So there's a lot of things. It's good. Yeah. There's a lot of things there for, for viewers to do. Um, yeah, I think it just came down to the fact that we knew there was more than enough to make another movie. I mean, oh, yeah, at this point, yeah, yeah. I think we could make a fourth movie if we if we really wanted to. Now, the trick with this one was like, you know, the trick with this one was how do we make it a, a direct sequel to to the Mothman and Point Pleasant, but like have it stand on its own as mm. a, like visu- visually. Okay. Um, and so Moth. I recently rewatched the Mothman of Point Pleasant, strangely enough, while standing in the Mothman Museum. And I was like, I was, <laughs> I was struck by the fact that the movie still looks pretty good. Like for a mm. 2017 release for us, and given that we change and grow, hopefully project to project, like I was surprised when I rewatched it because I was like, man, this definitely get, has its own look. Like it is very distinctly its own thing. And, um, so we wanted to when we made mothman legacy we were very aware of that like this has to be its own thing okay um so going into the the so what happened one of the big things that happened last year is we had two projects two two films come out one of them had the most um animated sequences in an sdm film we've ever had and that was terror in the skies Mm -hmm. and the other the other had no animated sequences really and that was Momo. And so, so pe- fun, though. people didn't pick up on that shift, but that was like Momo in a way is, is, was the first STM movie to indicate that we were moving away from, from that animation. Um, mm. And some of that just had to do with the fact that we had reached a point in working with Scalf, with Chris Scalf, where he was just kind of, he's too busy. <laughs> like you can't mm-hmm. keep doing okay. projects with us. And we were ready to start trying to tell those, rec- do those recreations ourselves, you know, like to, to actually try yeah. to either practical, practical effect wise or, or CG, whatever it is, we wanted to, to be able to do those recreations ourselves and control the look of them. And so Mothman Legacy is the first like big STM effects film where all the effects are either CG or practical. Um, so, yeah. So uh, you were, uh, so thank you for, you know, set, uh, I was able to see a screener of it and uh, you're exactly right. The, the effects in this film are s- amazing. Um, looking at previous STM films and now looking at this it's like it blows my mind how you know it, that combined with the music the music is awesome dude like that is quite the soundtrack and like when you listen when you watch this movie uh with headphones it's a different experience like it, it just all around like the tension in this movie it's weird it's like it's interviews but there are also scenes where you're like you're just like you know like dark night tensed up like it's good man like yeah the yeah the um the the score is great he brandon actually brought in some of those like celtic Mm -hmm. uh celtic instruments and things that'll call back to the the apple i mean the appalachian history that people keep telling me to ask Um, (laughs) like it all calls back to that stuff um and then the yeah i think um visually the trick with this one was like the recreations we can we can pretty easily slap together like a, a recreation, just shoot something and then hand it off to Santino and Santino sure. will find a way to make it work. But it gets like stale. So there's some recreations in this that I'm super proud of, like how we pulled them off um, from a filmmaking standpoint. Like the, th- the three that stand out to me always are, um, well, there's, there's actually four. The one is, um, the scene with the, the where Susan Shepard is talking about hearing the Mothman walking on a roof. Oh, geez. Um, yes. As a kid. Yes. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> um, that up angle 
shot, like looking over over, over my niece Dixie's shoulder, because that's who's in that scene is my niece Dixie. And Dixie's actually in the movie like five times. Um, oh, man. So, so that shot I'm super proud of. Uh, looks really cool. And then uh, the other one is is the scene that's um, Leah Wilson's encounter where she heard the Mothman flying near her uncle or maybe it's her grandma, grandpa. I can't remember. Near she was in an old farmhouse and she heard Mothman coming down the the holler, ran to the window, mm-hmm. and that's the first time where I managed to sneak not sneak, but that's the first time where I I had a very clear idea of how to use slow motion. Um, in a, in a recreation and and then Santino was able to make his visuals work with that so like she she opens the door or opens the window and there's the sh- you know the mothman flies by the window but it, we shot it at 120 so it's like a really slow okay. motion yep. um really intense slow motion and i wanted that scene to be like somewhere between like scary but also sort of like regal or majestic yep. like you're yeah, no thing. exactly right yeah 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 uh and he pulled that off and then the other two um uh, just the making of those scenes is hilarious because it was just aaron and i i had to shoot all these recreations myself um <laughs> so every COVID. single re- yeah because yeah, of covid so every single recreation i shot um and thankfully i had aaron on the last two and the one is less odell's recreation which i think is going to be the one that everyone talks about probably the most um and that's the one where the uh, less wakes up in the middle of the night and this thing's in oh, his room i don't i don't really want to give away too much yeah don't don't because it's good man it's yeah, really good yeah that one was really fun to shoot because we um we actually shot it in the house where we filmed um we filmed the interviews for the Boggy Creek Monster DVD. Really? Yeah, it oh, was man. Aaron's. It was Aaron's old house. So Aaron just kind of rejoined the crew this year after like a three year absence. Okay. So, so um, him and I shot it in that house, even though no one's living there right now. And um, we got in his his father in law owned it, and actually I guess they just sold it. So we got in this window where it was open, and we were able to use it. So. I, I just really like some of the individual shots in that sequence. There's a shot of like a fan in the foreground spinning and like Les is laying on the ground. Only Les is played by me, which, <laughs> <laughs> which nice. you know, again, COVID. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, but I just think that sequence came together. The other that I think is really cool is the, um, is uh, it's either Ron Lanham's scene where he sees it in the road, which I filmed down at Rogue's Hollow late at night. Um, okay. you're not you're not supposed to be on that road and rogues hollow is like this nice. creepy yeah creepy locals uh park it's not a state park it's like a county park but it's not an official county park anyway rogues hollow was like the most supposedly the most haunted place in ohio um so we filmed down there late at night one night and the other sequence that i really like in that movie is uh the abandoned house scene where where jack tells the story about seeing the mothman standing in this abandoned house late at night oh yeah yeah and totally. all of those have to have their own little weird identity. So mm-hmm. like the, the, the Jack, um, Jack story about seeing it in the abandoned house, my idea for that one was like the, the camera's always turning. It's so like mm-hmm. in every shot, the camera's actually moving um, and, and it's mimicking the movement of the bicycle wheel. Cause he was, he was pushing a bicycle home when he saw mm-hmm. it. And so like each shot, each individual frame is sort of twisting. And there's a really cool shot that we did um, where he first sees the Mothman inside the, the abandoned building. The camera pushes in toward the Mothman standing in the building and all these moths come out of the building and the camera's like yeah. going clockwise. Um, it's cool. It's really cool, man. That was a really cool moment, yeah. Um, my favorite was... Um just going over like the interactions between uh, is Jeff Wamsley, right. Who owns yep. the Mothman and like how he's passing that on to his daughter. That, well, that was really cool. Like that whole, like that whole section. I love that just as a parent, that's very cool. Yeah. And it's the, that's the, that's the legacy. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if sense, some people yeah. will get that. That's like, that's the name. The namesake is the Wamsleys. That's why I dedicated mm-hmm. the movie to the Wamsleys okay. because like, the, the Mothman legacy is Jeff leaving the museum to Ashley, <laughs> you know, like yeah. 
that's the actual legacy. It's also like that legacy is also the Appalachian settlers and the Native Americans who lived there, mm-hmm. probably having some role in the Mothman, whatever that would be, the, the Mothman being there today. So I want to do a quick check on everything doing good so far. Time wise, we're good. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You're yeah, good. good. Okay, because yeah, I I got I got some more. I just wanted to make keep, sure yeah. that you're no, good. No, keep them going. All right, all right. Let's go. Let's go, man. Okay. Uh, let's let's uh talk about Bigfoot for a bit. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. There's this question I have that I got when I was watching on the trail of Bigfoot, the first one. Yeah. Second one's not out. And I can't remember if I've actually asked you this or not, mm-hmm. but I'm just going to go for it. So I remember thinking this when I'm watching the Area X episode and I'm like, Seth has really bad migraines. And then I'm like, could that be related to infrasound? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely no. not. Case closed. <laughs> no. I no. <laughs> I, it's, I've I've had other people try to try to ask me that, but okay. no, it's it's just not. Like All I right. had I had comparable migraines while we were shooting uh, on the trail of Bigfoot, the journey in mm-hmm. the Adirondacks. Okay. Um, I had comparable migraines while we were filming uh, Boggy Creek Monster. Mm-hmm. I had comparable migraines while we were shooting Terror in the Skies. I just get hmm. migraines when I'm okay. filming. Yeah. When I'm filming, yeah, sure. and and some of it also has to do with like, I I go to a doctor. I've gone to it. You know, I, I go to doctors because my headache uh, headaches. And I had a guy tell me once, like, it you you're like the perfect storm because you have every type of headache there is. Wow. I get I get um, I get sinus headaches. I get tension headaches. I get oh jeez pressure headaches i have yeah. uh migraines like i have all the every kind of headache you could have i have and yeah. and some of the like i think the adirondacks the first time i went to the adirondacks i had migraines the whole time i was there i actually think it has something to do with like the clean air like the air so huh. clean in those places yeah. like i think my body can't can't comprehend what's happening and like i start getting some That's, sort of well, si- weird sinus yeah. headache you never know i'm sorry um, though if you want to, I can say yes. It was definitely no, you're fine. It's it's one of those things where you're like you're tired and you're watching something. You're like oh, oh and then you know it's just yeah. it's you being dumb. But um, I figured that was the case. But uh, so when you did on the trail of um, you're out in New England filming, mm-hmm. you guys were hanging out in Western Mass for a while, right? Yeah, we spent well not for a while. We were there for yeah maybe six hours. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the pace of like an SDM shoot is, is yeah. it's crazy. We, um, I mean, that day was a day from hell and heaven simultaneously. Mm. Like that whole trip seemed to be that way. That we drove um, basically like two and a half hours, I think, to get to Western Mass. But on the way there, yep. we had to stop in Kennewick, um, Kennewick, um, Kinderhook and mm-hmm. interview. York, yep. Yeah, and yeah. and do a an interview about the Kinderhook creature, oh, and yeah. um, I mean that interview was a disaster because I accidentally shot it at one twenty without realizing it, and then had to oh, reshoot geez. the entire interview. Oh, no. And yeah, it was just like that day was crazy. So we got into Western Mass at um, you know maybe like six or seven at night, and then we were there until two in the morning. Wow. Um, it might have been a little later than that. Might have been like seven or eight, but it it was like, you know, we were we we got to we were in there with the Squatch Massachusetts guys. We went on yeah, this, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we went on this hike back in the woods, nice. and um, it was super cool. I don't know, yeah. like like that. All I know is at the end of that night, you know, we left when we left Western Mass. It was like one o'clock in the morning. And we got to mm-hmm. Troy, New York, where I had booked us hotels, um, to sleep that night, so we didn't have to drive all the way back to the Adirondacks. Um, We stayed in Troy, New York that night. And I just remember getting into bed at like two or three in the morning and thinking that I can't, I couldn't recall an STM shoot that was that level of just constant activity. Hmm. Like our, the closest I think it's come is the, uh, the desert trip we took for on the trail of UFOs where it was uh, just Jason and I came from Ohio. Then Brandon met us out there and we, it was Brandon shannon myself and jason and wow. we just did 
constant filming for like four four days but even that had basically two days in vegas where all we did was hang out so that's this cool. was not, yeah. this was not that yeah so i i grew up in western mass uh and it's a, such a beautiful area and i'm glad you got to hang out there for at least six hours like yeah i love i love that it was i grew up in northfield i think you guys you were well you probably were like i don't know if you can say where you were, were you in like berkshires or um, we were yeah. in Savoy. Oh, dude, yeah, Savoy State Jeez. Forest or whatever. Like, um, yeah. So we were near. We were near a, a town. I can't remember what the name of the town was, but the town was weird. There's some weird stuff out there, dude. Like, it is definitely Squatch Town, and like well, we Savoy were there and stuff. Yeah, we were there at a weird time too, because COVID was going on, and the yep. riots had just kind of come oh, into. Yeah to the town we were in and i guess they were pretty bad there so there mm. was it was like a ghost town when we were there oh wow um and so yeah it was a very strange point in time it's a very mm-hmm. like that that whole trip was like a very strange point in time anyway because for most of us on the crew it was our first time to really be out living again after yeah, like right. months mm-hmm. of being holed up in our homes so yeah. um so yeah You'll see, like the movie's very much about this point in time. Okay. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that next year there's two on the trail of Bigfoots. Yeah. Which or which is awesome. Uh, mm-hmm. that that was kinda I, I knew about one of them, but I guess I hadn't uh heard about the other one, which is great. So uh what's can you tell kind of like what's the difference between the two or like you know, why two well, instead of like one big one, you know? Well, on the trail of Bigfoot one is technically two films. On the trail of That's Bigfoot true. the Legend, yep, true. on the trail of, of Bigfoot the Search. So if you look at it, mm-hmm. this is actually three and four, and not two. Oh, not okay. not like on the trail of Bigfoot two. It's technically okay. on the trail of Bigfoot three and four. So, hmm. um, yeah, on the trail of Bigfoot, the journey is all about our trip to um, the Adirondacks after being well, like I just said, after being holed up in our house for months. Um, okay. because of uh, the pandemic um and on the trail of bigfoot the discovery which has not been officially announced on our social media but i've been posting things about it that will be um about uh a, a our our return trip to the olympic peninsula to hang out with the olympic oh, project guys yes and um to go <laughs> to go up into oh. um, some of the hopefully get up into like the nesting site and all that please kind of stuff yeah do the nest yeah. oh my goodness um so that's that's the plan for that one um you know i have a really good friend that i grew up with here in ohio named brent who lives out in oregon and okay. he um he's not at all into bigfoot but he is into customizing uh overland vehicles and, of course, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When he found out I was going to be out there, he's like, "Dude, you have to borrow a car or one of my vehicles oh, and I put it in." Dude, the like, Heck yeah. So we're going to go out there and get this um, customized like Gladiator and take it out, and we're going nice. to be able to like it's it's got a camper attached to it and all this stuff. So we're going to be able to use that as well. So yeah, we're stoked about that, and I think that crew is going to be interesting too because I think Adrian's going. So I think I think oh. this is going to be like the first on the trail of especially on the trail of bigfoot where adrian's actually in it I love um, it. Yeah. so she's going to be in it and then um i'm really hoping you know crew wise i can get alexander involved and yep. um and yep. andrew um peterson i'm trying to get him on that crew as well he's supposed to be doing Do something it. else with me before then Do it. so yeah this is the year i keep telling him like either 2020 or 2021 is, is when it's happening you know what? And I am so glad that is it is happening. So definitely that is amazing news. Like shout out to Andrew. Andrew's Andrew's my dog. Like he's the man. Um this is gonna be a question where feel free to shut it down if you need to, but I'm gonna ask it. So it feels like STM is getting ready to launch into some amazing things. Um, it just, I have a feeling, is there anything, any light you can shed to that? Or like, it, it feels like you're making some big moves. Um, I don't know, man. To no? me, it feels, no, I don't, I don't have that same hmm. sense. 
because for me it's like um yeah i think we we continue to grow but we you know the honestly it's frustrating in a way because the growth that needs to take place is all predicated on money uh-huh. and and yeah we could we could have we could have had a tv show last year uh-huh. um we were in the final stages of signing paperwork wow. um when when we walked away and it had to do with the adam wingard collaboration that never took place and mm-hmm. still hasn't taken place and um so we ended up we ended up walking away from the show and doing you know going with the wingard thing um so yeah i don't know like we've got a lot of things on the burners but okay you never know what's going to actually take place like mark maskey and jason Yudis wrote a script for a a fictional film based based on the abe canyon incident um i've heard you talk about this yeah 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 that we want to make um as our first fictional film and we do like we have a manager who she's i've never talked about her publicly like who she is but her name's elizabeth fowler she's a film producer if you google search her you will be shocked that she's involved in sdm she's like awesome she's like a legit producer she she produced this Kyra Knightley movie official secrets last year she's she's um yeah she's 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 pretty awesome she's tied into like scott derrickson and all these guys but it's it's a weird cool. story like how we even got connected with her um but she's our manager and she's she really wants to like try to get this movie made um and at the same time i'm very picky about or very um I'm very set on the fact that I don't want to lose control. Yep. So, um, so either I'm steering the ship at the end of the day, or it's just not going to happen. And like, it's been that way from the beginning and that'll probably like someday that, that might end up biting us in the butt because Mm -hmm. that, that extends to like, even, even things like investors and stuff like that i've walked away from just because we oh, wow. we i hate to lose control of our money and like what we can spend it on and things like that so gotcha. um so yeah there's a lot of things that that might happen but it's also like trying to figure out the best way to spend what money we do have and hopefully grow um as a company and grow our audience while still retaining our independence that's been mm. the hardest thing to figure out because everyone wants a piece yeah and i th- I, I think if mothman legacy is as big as i think it's going to be because of how much they want to dump into the marketing and all that kind of stuff i think if it's as big as i think it's going to be it's only going to get harder even if mm-hmm. we even if on a surface level it seems like we're more successful or whatever yep. because we have to figure out w- it still all comes down to well how do we manage to do all this completely independent so we're not beholden to anyone um and so we can continue to steer the ship and and in a way like as goofy as the sound like s- some of that comes down to like principles and like even morals and are we doing what we what we should be doing with the company or what we you know my dog's barking at something in the next room. um <laughs> but she didn't like the she she hates morals if i start like, get out of here morals, yeah uh yeah it's just like it's a weird it's a weird thing to do because we took a company we've we've i we took it we created something out of nothing mm-hmm. and that's yeah not, which is amazing like, yeah yeah that's not like super common but yeah. um like at the end of the day i always say that i will go back to medical billing or landscaping or or whatever mm-hmm. before i before I see myself become miserable making movies. Like if I, if I were to be in a situation where I'm the reason I'm happy doing this is because I'm doing it. I, I I make the rules. I'm the guy, (laughs) the guy that steers the ship. Um, if I, if I had a boss, I would be, she's, she's growling. So she's probably gonna start barking again. Um, (laughs) If I had a boss, I don't think I would be as content doing this, and I don't know that I would work as hard at it mm. as I, as I do. Because you, you might, you know, like 
that was what I hated about medical billing, aside from the fact that it's just monotonous, as you're right. told what to do by your overlords. And if we're yeah. in a situation, that's why I always bristle at TV shows. Is like, it, you know, when you're when you're involved in that, you're being told what to do, and you really don't have any creative control over it at all, regardless of what they tell you, because they'll tell you every single we've done, we've had. 20 30 phone calls no joke 20 or 30 just between 20 and 30 phone calls in in five years where we actually spoke to people we've probably had a hundred phone calls where they call us trying to get wow. involved somehow it happens i know last year between january and march we had 20 calls come to adrian That's crazy but they 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 all want the same thing. They want what we have at the cheapest available price, and they want to tell us what what they can, what they're going to be able to do with our thing or what we're yeah. creating. Not cool. Yeah. So so it is like I'm not I'm not arguing what you said. Like I do think it's probably a big like I think we're probably it's probably a big year coming up, especially like the remainder of this year is huge because it's our first year with the distributor. Yes, exactly. So, like, all of our income is in their hands, which is terrifying. Because <laughs> um, we signed uh, over, we signed yeah. over like um, a number of the catalog titles to them as well. Okay. But it was also a step we had to take because you can't continue to function the way we were. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're, we were in a sink or swim situation because of what Amazon continues to do year in and year out. With I, yeah, no, cutting payouts yeah. to creators. Yeah. It's anyway, I'm 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 rambling, but uh, it's a big year. I just think like I tend to be a little more paranoid about where we're going as well. So, no, uh, you're that was a good answer. So now we have get ready for the listener questions. Mm -hmm. Um, these are all over the place, and okay. it could be pretty wild and crazy. And uh, here we go. Okay. So <clears throat> first one, Jedi imposter, Greg, uh, who would you like to hear speak at a Bigfoot or paranormal or cryptic conference? Who would be like your number one person that you would think would be pretty cool? Um, Jane Goodall. Yeah, dude, that would be sweet. And I know people yeah. love to like talk about the fact that she supposedly believes Bigfoot exists. I just would like to hear the truth. The truth. I want to know if that's actually true. Like, do you actually believe do you actually think Bigfoot exists? Are you just being, are you just being hopeful or is there something, that you, mm. some insight you can give us into the thought process there? Because everyone knows that she's said before, like she thinks Bigfoot exists, but I would like to know, I'd like to ask follow-up questions to that. So I understand. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. Um, and these are all Instagram usernames. Like if people listening to this are like, oh, I wish I could look up this person. Well, now you can. Okay. Uh, user I am Matsky, Andy Matsky says, what is your favorite Andy Matsky related memory? Oh my God. Of course it would be about him. Uh, right. yeah, exactly. That's a good question though. You know what? Like just watching that kid grow up has been crazy. Cause I've known him since he was 11. Mm. Um, so like just seeing him go from like little you know little Andy to to coming on the Bellwood shoot by himself like no parents um, mm -hmm. was pretty was pretty wild. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a moment or anything that stands out. Uh, I mean him and his dad. I think like I told Mark this when we were at when we were shooting on the trail of Bigfoot in the PNW the first time, but watching the way Mark has raised him has mm -hmm. given me insight in, into how I want to raise Tommy That's because awesome. they're, they're so, they're so close to each, you know, they're still, they're still so close um, as father and son. That's not really an answer to his question, but it's, it's probably just watching him grow up. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I actually, uh, I am interviewing Andy in a few days and I am excited to uh, see his uh, take on the whole uh, STM process and like his growing up in a cryptid type 
monster household. It would be cool. I, that'd yeah. be a fun interview. Uh, he also asks, what's the first thing you do to prepare for an STM film? Um, the first thing I do, is that what yeah. it is? The first thing yeah. I do? Yeah, that's what he says, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's boring because it's just like I go and I, <laughs> I read like I read like internet I I Google search it and then I read about it. You know, okay. the the interesting part of that to me comes in when you get into the minutia of like I mean not minutia but it is kind of what what is this movie going to be visually? That's mm. the like for me that is the fun part because then I get to sit around and either watch movies or I. Or I watch like making of documentaries about movies I'm interested in, um, and I'm not ripping them off. I'm, I I just kind of look for inspiration in, in right. those places, and it a lot of the time I get inspiration for the looks of things and weird. Like I'm a huge um, Last Chance You fan, which is like this Netflix docu series about a, okay. about about uh, junior college. Oh junior yeah. College. yeah 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 okay. yeah yeah football teams sure um and i th and now that i've i a new season it just came out right before we shot bellwitch and i think it snuck its way into a lot of bellwitch as weird yeah. as that might Be seem that's interesting yeah, yeah. okay that would be fun it, to watch yeah. i think just visually there's there's some <clears throat> elements there that i picked up on while i was watching out that show like maybe that's subconsciously awesome. yeah cool uh, user Bigfoot Anonymous says, "What's your favorite Ohio monster that you have not covered yet?" Big head, big head, yeah, yeah. big head, or the Charles Mill Lake monster. Okay, so it's one of those two. And fun fact, like deep trivia here. This is um, <clears throat> the follow-up to Minerva Monster was supposed to be a movie about Big Head, Old Orange Eyes, and the Charles Mill Lake monster. It was supposed it. to be like we were supposed to do this movie that was kind of going to be an anthology hmm. um, with three different STM mini films buried in this one film. And um, we never made it. What I found out was that the, the big head witnesses um, are either dead or the boy who was involved in it uh, was in like a car wreck and can't, I mean Ooh. like mentally he's not even there anymore. Oh, so man. you can't interview him about it. Oh. Um, but the big head story is super interesting and it happened in the same summer as the Minerva monster sightings and maybe like two hours west of Minerva. Um, Charles Mill Lake is monster is super cool. Cause it's like creature from the black lagoon. Okay. And it took place in the early 1950s. It was this armless, like amphibian frog, frog creature. And it was also Charles Mill Lake is where I cannot, I'm trying to think of it. There was, the, there's this famous, UFO encounter that took place with an army helicopter. Um, and people mm. always talk about it as taking place over Ashland and Ashland's nearby, but they actually intercepted the helicopter intercepted the UFO over Charles Mill Lake, which I always thought was kind of cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and we actually cool. did, I drove to Charles Mill Lake just a few during COVID <clears> during like the height of the lockdown. Um, it would have been like maybe late March. We actually drove to Charles Mill Lake just so I could see it. Nice. So there's nothing else to do. Hey, yeah, locked on is like that. <laughs> uh, user Outcast at last says, "Have you ever considered Lake Erie monster, Bessie, or Loveland yeah. Frogman?" Yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, we definitely thought about it, but okay. Bessie's, you know, Bessie's another lake monster, and mm. and um. Adrian, I'll tell you, Adrian really wants to do on the trail of lake monsters, which would be us going would around to, to various lakes and looking at lake monsters. Um, mm. So if we did that, you know, Bessie's a definite possibility. Um, as for Loveland Frog, that story is super cool, mm -hmm. um, but the witnesses are kind of gone. You can't okay. really, you can't really get to them. Gotcha. Also, that's one of those things where I'm not sure how commercially viable that would be for us yeah. just just realistically uh moth boy matt says uh what are your top three bands that you've been jamming on in 2020 so far Ooh, 2020 yeah, there's a new cool. airborne airborne toxic <clears throat> album out um and uh airborne's a weird band because i have seen that they're one of the few bands that i've seen multiple times live 
Okay. And I, and I don't love any of their music, but I've seen mm. them. Uh, I've seen them multiple times. They were an amazing live band. Absolutely okay. just rad. Like you really can't, their energy is great. Um, their new album, I think it's called Hollywood Park. Um, there's a couple songs on there. One of them, which, which is drilled into Andy's head because I listened to it like a dozen <laughs> times on the UF, uh, on the Bigfoot trip up in the Adirondacks. Um, it's called All These Engagements, I think. Um, yeah, Airborne Talks are fan. Um, I never stopped listening to Jimmy at World, so there's been a lot of Jimmy nice. at World. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, oh, man, I'm trying to think. Tommy keeps Tommy's favorite song. My son, oh, uh, my, my, yeah. my three-year-old son's favorite song right now is by uh, Judah and the Lion. Nice. Uh, okay. It's, it's called Suit and Jacket. And it's yeah, essentially, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's essentially about like trying to find yourself before you die. And that's Tommy's favorite song. That's so, awesome, man. I wouldn't say Judah and the Lion, though. I would say, okay. yeah, Airborne Toxic Event, Jimmy World. Um, and then it's probably going to be, um, Juliana theory maybe this year. I've been oh, yeah, going sure. back to Juliana theory a lot. Okay. Um, so it's probably those, Oh, the new, you know, like my wife and I, the week before COVID broke out, went to see the get up kids in downtown Canton at this oh, tiny, man. tiny, tiny little club. Um, I mean, where we were standing like 50 feet from the stage and there was like yeah, maybe yeah. 200 people there and it was great. They played like a great show because that new album, that Satellites album they just put out is really good. Yeah, that would be a good time. Uh, he also asked, "What would you dig making a doc on uh, Fae Folk? Yeah, yeah, because I think, and I think that's actually like a possibility at some point because um, I feel like there's, there's some UFO connections there that I think are really interesting. And my wife has a, has her own fairy story. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, user, well, Tate Hieronymus asks, what are your thoughts on the Bluff Creek film project? Tate's always going back to Bluff Creek. Dude, um, he's, his stories are amazing though. Like the guy's connections are wild. Like when I, when I interviewed him a few back, like he was blowing me away. Oh, I know that dude from, sorry, now I'm chewing an ice. I met, I met Tate in San Francisco um, at the Bigfoot Bonanza, which was like the coolest Bigfoot conference there ever was. And it only lasted two years. Uh. Um, But uh, I met him at, at, at that event. He's a cool dude. Um, he is. What was his question, though? What do I think of it? <clears throat> yeah. The massacre? No, sorry. It's uh, the Bluff Creek film. Don't, don't bring that up. The Bluff Creek film project. Yeah, I don't know. What do I think of the project or what do I think of the, the, the film? I think he's saying, have you seen, the, have you seen his movie on YouTube? Which is actually Oh, I got you. Cool. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I, I didn't see it on YouTube. I saw it on the big screen. Oh, so like I okay. saw it, yeah, I saw I saw his movie when I saw it at Bigfoot Bonanza. He might not even remember that I was there, wow. but um, I saw it, I saw it there, and it was cool. And when it comes to to the PGF, it's fake. Like, sorry, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Kill, kill it. Well, you asked the question, Tate. Then so there you go. So thanks for asking. I'm just kidding. The PGF, <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. No, I, I, have I think they're cool. It's cool. Yeah. I have questions about the PGF is the thing. Like we, we the come actual back. film, the actual film. I have questions. Oh I have boy, many Seth. Questions. Really? You have many questions. I have questions about it. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Like you don't, you. Uh, here's the thing about it. Okay. I, All right. If there's, if there's, if the, if the PGF is a hoax, I don't think Gimlin was involved necessarily. Oh. I don't, okay. well, I don't think he had to be involved um, because I actually think it's much more convincing if you leave people that were there in the dark about it. So they're not lying. They're, they're genuinely convinced that what they saw is real. So the thing that I go back and forth on is there's no way they could have recreated, they could have created that costume with 
what they had available at that time. I don't see how it's possible, but yeah, I know. You know. It drives you crazy, right? Yeah, I suppose. There's too many, <laughs> co- but that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. if it's a costume, we should have the costume. At we the should same, be able to recreate at it. At the yeah. same time, to my eye, what I'm seeing in that video does not appear to be real. Does not appear to be a flesh and blood creature to me. Never uh, has. Even when you watch like the HD and like you can see like the thigh month, really? Yeah, man. Wow. Okay. Well, I I respect your opinion. I, yeah. I'm all I'm all for I'm I'm totally fine with the people that, that think it's real though. Okay. Like, cool. And I'm not saying I don't think it's real. I'm just saying I have questions about it. Is there are there episodes of Sasswa where you uh discuss that out or I haven't listened to the whole back catalog of Sasswa. I think we I think we spent a lot of time talking about that. Really? Um okay. but it could be wrong. I know Mark and I talk about it almost every time we Wow. We get together. Actually we had a big discussion about it when we were driving to uh to Massachusetts. Oh, Mark man. is is I think Mark was vehemently in defense of the PGF. If I recall correctly. Well, good for Mark. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, it's yeah, it's okay to not agree with someone. We can still have civil discussions and respect sure. people. You know? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's cool. Just to, like have your head examined. <laughs> Seth. This is this, is, this feels oh my like gosh. This, this feels like Seth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um so the last ones are all from the same guy, uh, my buddy Josh, Jay Sewich. He's a he's a cool dude. Uh, so how has film? They get kind of deep, so get ready. How has filmmaking changed your perspective on the value of narrative and personal experience? Whoa! Yeah, um, I can repeat it again if you need me to. Yeah. Okay. How, how has nice. How has filmmaking, filmmaking changed your changed. perspective on the value of narrative and personal experience? Man, I mean, no. the the narrative part of this, I don't quite, I can't even wrap my head around what he's asking with that part. Hmm. But the, I mean, I can tell you that there is a point in every shoot where I have to step back and look at what is going on around me and appreciate it I like that yeah. like on a on a really profound level because like i okay. you know it's like i said i was miserable for years with mm-hmm. what what i was doing and to be able to make movies for a living yeah um i love it j- just that part of it has given me a, a, an appreciation for life that might not have been there before um so that's not answering his question at all but um I'm sure it's given me like these greater insights into, into storytelling and, and things like that, but I can't verbalize. I'm terrible anymore. I'm really bad at verbalizing like what's in my head. And I, and it, it seems like every year I get dumber. Like my, <laughs> like my brain just, I keep losing brain cells. I think he'll dig that answer though. That's a good answer. Uh, what are your top dream collaborators for a film project? Um, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would love to work with like, uh, geez, I don't know. That's a good question. It is, yeah. You know, like, I think it would be to have like Steven Spielberg produce a movie I made because that'd be cool. Spielberg did all the those amazing like executive produced movies in the 80s right. he right. kind of doesn't do that as much anymore but mm-hmm. um yeah um collaborative though i don't know that's a good question but i can't really think of an answer right now all right that's okay uh how have you how do you view that you've grown as an artist in the last three years three years yeah um Hmm. Damn. That's a good question too. Uh, I mean, I, I think we, gr- I'm hoping we're growing month to month. Right. Because like we don't, the biggest thing, like I said, is not to stagnate. And, and that, that extends to the fact that I never want to be 
satisfied with where I'm at. Mm. So, so I'm always, I'm always keenly aware of all the mistakes I'm making <laughs> in every okay. project. So like when people get on Facebook and like tag me and post telling me they, they thought this movie like Momo was insane and sucked or whatever, I, you know, like <laughs> all the, all the issues you might have with whatever I've made, I've already, you know, I've already seen them. I don't agree mm. about Momo. I think Momo was like one of the genius strokes, yeah, I love of, Momo strokes of genius so that good. we've had. Yeah. But, um, but uh, yeah, I, I hope it's month to month and I hope it, uh, you know, um, visually, I hope the, 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 you know, the B roll is getting better. I hope, um, mm -hmm. you know, we'll see. It's funny. Cause like, we'll see. Um, I remember after we finished Boggy Creek monster, I, I thought how during, during the making of the movie, I was really into all the camera movement. We were constantly putting the camera on gimbal and, and just like running or, or we were on a boat moving through the water or whatever. And I remember watching it later and thinking what a bunch of like unmotivated camera movement it's just ca ca mm. cameras constantly moving for no apparent reason and i know for the longest time we went the opposite direction so we went from boggy where the camera is constantly moving to the mothman point pleasant where it never moved um, okay every shot was locked down and then we we kind of stayed in that mode for a while and i know with the mothman point or the mothman legacy i started getting back into the gimbal and the slider. And now we're to the point where we got rid of the black magics, which was, you know, like what happened is we made, so we made, um, we were pretty much all Sony with the big full frame cameras up through Boggy. And then after Boggy, we switched to a digital Bolex for, for the Moth Made of Point Pleasant, which I think is one of the reasons it, it has its unique look. It's because mm -hmm. we shot with this camera that had a super 16 sensor. So it's this tiny sensor. Okay. Um, and then after that, we just kind of stuck in that mode and we, we really were happy with that like black magic kind of look. And um, now we're getting back into the Sony's and, and I think you'll see with Bell Witch, there's a ton of camera movement. Again. Awesome. Um, a lot of like gimbal movement and things like that. And, <laughs> even like the uh the recreations there's a ton of camera movement so it's yeah it's like we we kind of like ref refined the we work on we work one way for a while and then when i get bored with that we move in another direction and it a lot yeah. of times it's going back in the direction we we're in before but finding a new way to make it work so nice. like yeah, Mothman Legacy. I wanted I wanted that camera movement, but I didn't want it to be like unmotivated. I wanted there to be a reason why the camera is moving through the B roll and all that. And then you know, with with the recreations, if you track back to the Mothman of Point Pleasant, which is the first movie where we really started doing full on recreations, um, and you go from Mothman of Point Pleasant, which was just three years ago up to today with the Mothman legacy, I think you can track that growth on the recreations where in Mothman and Point Pleasant, it was really just about, I shot those, most of the live action recreations for that on my iPhone. And really? It, yeah. And Oh, wow. And it, so it was more about just getting what the minimum we needed done so we could get on screen what people were talking about. And now okay. we're trying to, you know, I think what we're trying to do is blend like a, a cinematic narrative style with documentary. And mm -hmm. so when it comes to the, to the recreations, it isn't just about visually representing what someone experienced. It's also doing that in a way that an audience can connect with emotionally, you know, like even if they don't realize they're, they're doing you know like hmm. even if they don't consciously realize it's affecting them um because you can just slap up what someone sees or s says they saw on screen that's what tv shows do that's what the travel channel does you know they they hire the 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 cheapest effects artists they can find and they send out a group of of interns with like 
you know, two hundred thousand dollar cameras, and they sh they they make them shoot something, and then those interns give it over to the cheap effects guy, and the cheap effects guy slaps together like a monster with red eyes, and that's like what you see in <laughs> on the trail of monsters or whatever that. Show. What was the show that was not? It wasn't on the trail of monsters. It was uh, Monster Quest or something like that. In search of monsters, the show. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so they do that kind of thing, and. I don't want to do, I don't want to be that. I want to mm -hmm. have, you know, like I want us to have an identity. I want to have, right. I want those sequences to have their own identity and be able to pull an audience into them. Nice. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. Uh, wow. Do you have a white whale story that you dream of taking on someday? Uh, yeah. I mean, this isn't the answer anyone's looking for. It's, I want to make this <laughs> movie. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make I want to make this movie 1999, which is just about me growing up in 1999. That'd be and, bomb, dude. And like that's that's my uh, yeah that's my white whale story. It's just yeah making a movie about growing up in a small town and like sleeping in line for so I could get tickets for the Phantom Menace, and that's like that's the movie I want to make. Yeah, sorry, I, I was did. having flashbacks to yeah yeah. Did you do that too? Um, no, but I remember uh -huh. Mothboy Matt talk, talking about your awesome Star Wars collection, which, so I, I did, the, well, the only movie I stood in line for was uh, Indy 4, which is, Ooh, was a terrible I did that, mistake. I did that too. Oh, I, had a, I had, me and my dad bought matching Indiana Jones hats. Oh so no. I don't hate dad, that movie. I don't hate that movie. So, I was ticked off at the time and I almost walked out when he started swinging through the trees of the monkeys. Yeah, that got me, that got me mad. But if you watch it now and you watch certain scenes, like it's actually like, it's cool, but that I, character kind of sucks. Wanna, oh I like gosh. Shia a lot, but that scene where he swings through the trees is, is yeah, it's, it's borderline. It's really, yeah, so you, what makes me mad about Indy 4, it, I'll just talk about this for a minute, but it's that, you know how in the other movies he has the scene where he, like, he looks like, oh, I'm going to die. Like he has that scene. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't do that in Indy 4. And that just made it like not as, I don't know. I, I miss that like where he's like, oh, I'm going to die, yeah, whatever. But but that's that's like a, that's a, that one thing kind of <clears throat> encapsulates what we've lost with Spielberg. Because oh, yeah. like he used to, he used to make movies about characters that were, that we could identify with. Yep. And now he makes movies about characters we really can't identify Jeez, with. I mean, yeah. like most of you know, like, and when he does do it, even in movies I love, it's like disingenuous. Like I mm. love Ready Player One. Like I own Ready Player One. Still haven't seen it. And like, yeah. there's, but at the same time, it just doesn't. It feels like. It feels like someone making a Spielberg homage. Oh like, man, that's, that's what it feels like. It's weird. Yikes. It's Spielberg making an homage to himself. Yeah, but I mean, like, I miss the Spielberg that made Close Encounters of the Third Kind and ET and sure. Jaws. You know, like where where he made movies about real people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now he makes movies about. He makes movies about real people, but they're people I can't identify with at all. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think it's a valid point. So main, believe it or not, we have made it through the gauntlet of all the questions and everything. Nice. Um, what, so right now, what, let's say if this is someone's first introduction to you, what are the ways that you like people to, um, man, they probably tuned out when I called everyone. I'm oh, on. oh no. I mean, the, there are a few times where probably we both said stuff that we were like, I'm out, I'm out here, but what, you know, not really, but um, what are ways that you like people to keep up to date with you and um, that they can check you out? Um, day -day. Yeah. Just small town monsters.com is probably okay. the best. Cool. Yeah. Small town monsters, social media. Um, I mean, my, my Instagram is open right now. I go back and forth with Instagram where I close it down and like make it, make it private. And then I like open it what? up again. Don't, I never know. Don't. I never know what to do because like, you know, like my, my Instagram when I'm not making a movie is super boring. It's just like put pictures of my kid. Yeah. And um, 
so right now my my insta is open so you could follow me on there but i mean it's mostly going to be you know my child and you might find that boring um huh. i'm on twitter but i rarely update okay um to be honest when when the when the trump presidency started it was just kind of like <laughs> Twitter oh, turned boy. into a dumpster fire oh, along no, with, here we go. With, with pretty much every other social social media avenue. So like I've had to I've had to <laughs> bail, bail from most from most social media. Um, yeah, I mean I'm on all social media, but I don't I don't interact much on there anymore. Like Are I you on TikTok. I, no, I had it for so Amy, <laughs> who's actually in who's in Mark of the Bow Witch. That's my wife's me okay. uh, my wife's cousin yeah um and she was like attempting to tell me why i needed to be on tiktok and then aaron who helps with like sdm movies he like runs a business where he like buys and no. sells vintage clothing and he has a, a TikTok. i follow him i follow him on uh on tiktok it got it got in my for you page because i'm into like thrifting and stuff too on the side and i was yeah. like wait a minute that's the guy from small town monsters <laughs> like what in the world he's actually got really good tiktoks like Everyone yeah, should check him out. He's constantly yeah. TikToking and he's, he's like telling me. So I was yeah. on there for like two days and then I shut it all down. Um, yeah, it's a, so it's I'm a waste of time. Kind of. I'm on I'm on Facebook and and uh, on Twitter and Instagram. If you okay. send me a Facebook friend request, I'm probably gonna ignore it. I just I I have like two thousand friend requests right now. Yeah, that's a just, ooh, man. Yeah, that's a I lot. just can't. Yeah, can't get to a it. point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, the best place is social. Oh, and the other place we have a uh, an official like small time monsters community Facebook group with like ten thousand. Oh, it's plus great! People. It's it's fantastic too. Yeah. So, so you can hop in there, uh, and yeah. I post in there sometimes. And I'm one of the admins, and I'm the only guy who typically will delete things. Um, mm. So okay. so if uh, so, I'm in there, so you can interact with me on there too. Yeah. No, that's a really good group actually. Um, yeah. So at this point, I'd like to, you know, say thank you to Seth for, for coming on. Thank you. Um, we are going to uh, shut down the episode, but we're going to stay on for a little bit. Uh, Seth has a few stories to, to share with the uh, Bigfoot Society After Dark for the Patreon. Uh, as you know, you can support that for $5 a month to keep the podcast going. So uh, thank you again, Seth, for coming on. And uh, at this time, I'm going to stop the episode and we'll transition. So thanks awesome. for listening, guys. We will uh, see you next week.